you guys can hear me though, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's too bad. I um I used to have a thing where I, I wanted to start every lecture with a YouTube video that would get people excited about the lecture content. And this was a really fun YouTube video I wanted to share with you. But if you just saw the guy playing guitar and you didn't hear him singing, it wasn't nearly as cool. Um, I'll share the link. You guys can watch the video offline. Uh, I think, let's see how many people we got here. If I go to participants, it shows me how many people. 43. Huh. We had 63 last week at this time. Or Thursday at this time. Uh, professor? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think you can share computer sound. You just have to check the option when you select which screen you want to share. Like there's a yeah. checkbox that says again. share computer sound. I will stop sharing and start again. Share. Share screen. Share computer sound. Yeah. Cool. Share. All right. We can watch a little bit of the video. At first I was afraid. I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never teach through canvas all the time. But then I spent so many nights reading the health docs for so long. And I grew strong. Can anybody tell me what we're talking about today? Manufacturing process and process variables. Outstanding manufacturing processes and process variables. Um, before we do that, let's just recap what we did last week. So manufacturing is making stuff people want. How do we know they want it? Or, or what is the stuff people want? Um, something that'll like solve an issue that a lot of people are having. Something that solves an issue that people are having. We usually call it a product, right? So the stuff people want, we're making a product when we do manufacturing. So, so making could involve lots of different things, right? I mean, the first thing it, I guess, before you could make something somebody wants, 
you have to um, you have to have a vision of what it is that they could want, right? So you have to have an idea. So so making starts with an idea, and um, and so we have an idea, and and if we're doing manufacturing to bring about this idea. Um, if we're doing manufacturing to bring about our idea, then we're taking some raw material, some some thing, say raw materials, so we're taking raw materials, we apply a manufacturing process to the materials, and we get out some value. Right, so we get out something that's worth more than what the raw materials were worth, but but it's worth it to the person who wants the product, right? So that's the customer. So manufacturing is making stuff people want. The people are the customers. The stuff is the product. The making involves all these processes. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to focus on and of course, the the raw materials and the processes, those all have cost, right? So so raw materials and processes have cost. Wait, before we get too far, there's a button I can click here that records this. Let's do that. Because last time I forgot to record. And that was annoying for me. I go to more. Nope, not anymore. I go up here. All right, I think I'm all set. So raw materials, apply a process, we get value, we get the product out. So we do apply our raw materials through a process. So we get the value out. Raw materials have cost. Uh, doing the process has cost. And uh, our goal for our manufacturing companies is to have a profit, right? And the profit equals the value minus the cost. And, um, and since we're engineers and we're going to apply this over time, what we really want is a profit rate. And that's value minus cost over time. So that, that pretty much summarizes what we did on Thursday. So manufacturing is making stuff people want, the stuff is the product, the people are the customer, the making happens by turning raw materials into something of value, that product by applying manufacturing processes. So what we wanna talk about today is what makes something a manufacturing process. So can somebody can somebody shout out a manufacturing process? Uh, an assembly line. So assembly. Additive. So additive manufacturing. So. So additive is a type of manufacturing process. What's, a, what's an additive manufacturing process you can think of? A 3D printer. So 3D printing. Uh, what's, what's another one? What, what's another additive manufacturing process? There's FDI. Actually, no. You might you might argue that assembly is an additive art manufacturing process, right? Assembly is putting stuff together. So you could argue that that's an additive process. But somebody has something? Say it again. I said the two types of 3D printing are FDM 3D printing and uh, SLA. Yeah, it's probably more than two different types of 3D printing, but we got uh, F. D M S L A. We've got laser L E and lens. 
laser. I don't remember what the thing is. They call it lens. But it's laser centered. There's powder bed laser centered. There's um, cold spray. There's there's a bunch of different ways people are doing three D printing. In fact, the, it seems to be the most exciting thing right now in uh, in manufacturing research is to be able to develop the next tool for three D printing. And I and I I kind of wonder about that because I don't think that we have clearly defined how to use most of the tools we have and when those tools are appropriate. Um, actually, I, I did a and there's there's much more work to do in this, but I did an MQP a couple of years ago where he was focused on FDM printing and, uh, and he made some models to talk about the strength of the 3D printed parts. He made the model, he made some test specimens, he broke the test specimens in a um, materials testing, a, an, an Instron device, broke the test specimens, proved that his model was correct so that he could predict mathematically how strong the 3D printed parts were gonna be when it was FDM with those different parameters. So that was kind of cool. This, there's a bunch of stuff going on. In fact, a lot of the a lot of the science in manufacturing right now has been focused around understanding this 3D printing stuff and understanding not the important science. There's been science about how to do 3D printing in different ways, but the real important science has been about understanding what are the strengths of materials. So um, Airbus said uh, said a couple of years ago that that year that they were going to put some number of millions of pounds of 3D printed parts in their airplanes. And, and I got a chance to talk to somebody who was an engineer at Airbus um, when that announcement came out. And I said, wow, because there's not a lot of published information about the strengths of those 3D printed parts. But what what are the parts you're putting in the airplanes? Anybody know what they were? So they were 3D printed and it was millions of pounds. They were gonna go in the airplanes they were making that year. Isn't it carbon Any fiber composites? Um, there's carbon fiber composites in the uh, it, probably in the layup of the of the frame, but I don't. That wasn't what they were talking about. And I, I don't know that I would call that 3D printing. A lot of that process is done manually still. Uh, they were they were 3D printing components in the um, the latches for the overhead compartments where you put your hand luggage. So they were so so not critical components, not things that keep the airplane in the air, and so so that was kind of interesting to me. They were bragging about the fact they were three D printing, but the things they were three D printing were not critical to keeping the airplane in the air. So so there's a lot of different three D printing stuff going on. Um, what are some other additive manufacturing processes besides three D printing? Anybody? Uh, injection molding. Injection molding. So. Uh, this is this is much easier in the classroom because when I spell something wrong and somebody calls me on it, I can hand them the red sharp the red marker and they can just do the red squigglies afterwards on the board. Um, but uh, injection molding, so molding of any kind, or why don't we just say casting? Now maybe that's additive, maybe that's a forming operation. Uh, but this, there's some more additive stuff. There's, there's a bunch of different. What, what are some other processes besides assembly, 3D printing, casting, or molding? Laminating. Laminating. And so you mean like when we're making fake IDs and we get the laminating machine out so that we can put plastic over the paper that we printed on? No, but that's a similar process. But I mean, for like laminating. That's components. also a manufacturing process, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I knew what you meant. Uh, what, what are some other manufacturing processes? Let's just let's 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 rattle some off quick. Joining. Joining. And um, all right. Anything else? Quick. Hydroforming. Because there's welding. Some some kind of forming. What'd you say? Welding. Welding. Yeah, welding, and that's another additive process. Sand blast. Anything else? Sand blasting. Anything else? Milling. Somebody said milling. 
And that's when you have the big water wheel that goes around and you bring the grain and you put it between the two stones and the stones rotate. Is that the kind of milling you meant? Is exactly, it milling yep. like subtract? So we're off whether it's additive or not. Sorry. So you, that's not the kind of milling that you meant? Did you, you more meant the, the kind of milling See if I can share my screen again. If only I was better at Zoom. So this is the kind of milling that you're talking about? So, so you meant milling as it, and, and so what I showed there was CNC milling. Anybody remember what CNC means? Computer numeric controlled. Computer numeric controlled. Does anybody know why it's called computer numeric controlled? You give the computer coordinates that it needs to move, and then it, move the, it moves the bit in the core. Uh, in those coordinates to so cut out the different parts. Yeah, but why don't we just call it computer controls? Anybody? Because it specifically uses um, a coordinate system. Yeah, but everything uses a coordinate system. Uh, the, the reason we call it computer numeric controls is before we brought computers into the loop, we actually had in, we actually had something we called numeric controls, which was really computer numeric control because they used computers to figure out what the numbers were, but they had they had mechanical readers, so they had uh, punch cards that you could feed in, and um, and, and so it was just, a, just kind of a different kind of computer. So. Before we had CNC machining, we had NC machining, numeric controlled machining, they called it. And so when they started connecting the computers directly to the machine tools, instead of having this uh, machine between them, they, uh, they started calling it computer numeric controlled so that the machinists wouldn't be confused. So CNC's, the N is there because it's been there. All right, so CNC milling, uh, what's another process? It, it, so, so actually, so this CNC milling, it's a, it's a machining operation. And oh, I am sharing my screen, huh? Okay, so I don't need to turn on screen sharing. Um, so CNC milling is a machining operation it's a material removal process. So when we talked about uh, the, uh, when we um, talked about uh, the 3D printing and the 3D printing and welding and things like that, we were talking about additive processes. This is a material removal process. And we actually call this material removal by large chip formation. And so, so basically, you get, you know, get the chat off the screen. So basically you get a cutting tool. So you get a, a cutting edge of the tool here. There's a relative velocity between the workpiece and the cutting tool. And the cutting tool moves through the workpiece. It creates a chip. We call milling a material removal process that uses large chip formation. Um, what other what other material removal processes can we think of? So sandblasting was one. But what else can we think of? Turning and boring. So turning, boring, cutting. Like so turning ice. turning is just like spinning around, right? 
That's a removal on the outside of a workpiece innately. So turning, yeah, so the, the only difference between milling and turning is that in milling, the tool rotates. So in, in milling operations, the tool rotates. And then you have, and the tool often has multiple cutting edges. So, so a rotating tool with multiple cutting edges then has relative motion with a workpiece and it removes material with large chips. In a turning operation, the workpiece rotates. So I got a I got a video of that too. If everything works, YouTube hasn't crashed. So in a turning operation, so here we've got the workpiece rotating. The tool is feeding into the workpiece, and you'll see this again here. So the workpiece is rotating. The tool is feeding in, and a chip forms on the top edge of that tool. We actually call that top edge the rake face of the tool. And we're gonna spend like a week, week and a half talking about rake faces. So I won't get too much into that right now. But so we've got milling, we've got turning. Um, what's boring? Professor? Besides this lecture. Yeah. Uh, we, we couldn't see the video that you put up. You can't, oh, cause I paused the sharing. Oh. But you could hear it through my microphone, huh? We could hear it. Yeah. Well, let me do it again. I'll stop the pause. Um, resume share. Look at that. OK. So here we go again. So the, the workpiece is rotating here. The tool is feeding into the workpiece. So the feed in this direction. And, uh, and then the chip forms on the top edge of the tool right there. And so this is a plastic part. The, uh, the chip was actually curling up into a little ball. Um, later in the class, we'll talk about why we don't like it when the chip curls up into a little ball. But uh, so these are processes that remove material by making large chips. And by large, I mean, you could pick them up and you could see the thickness. So could anybody think of a, uh, a material removal process that removes material with small chips? And sanding. Sanding. Sanding, grinding, lapping, any of these abrasive processes would remove material with small chips. And that's, that's really the difference. So in, in milling, we've got typically multiple cutting edges interacting with the material. So you guys saw the, the milling video, right? So you saw the milling video here. And so let's just look at this milling video here for a second. And plus it's got cool music. So, Oh, everything went black. Am I still here? Can you guys still see me? Yes. Okay. All right. So here, I pause it. You guys can all see the video. Yes. So we've got a tool holder that I'm. I've got the mouse over here right now. I think there's a way I can annotate the screen. Annotate. Oh, wow. I'm getting all excited about the technology now. All right, so here. I've got what's the, the bottom of the tool holder that we can see here. So I don't want it to play. Don't play the video. This is boring. I can't even control the thing anymore. Too much technology. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share. Maybe that'll make it go away.
All right. All right, what we saw in the video there is we had a we had a tool holder. There was a tool coming out of the tool holder. Can you guys still see me? Is everybody still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm having trouble. I can't stop the damn YouTube video, but I think I've closed all the windows that had YouTube open. Um, all right, so there was the tool holder. Coming out of the tool, there was a cutting tool, and there was a, a spiral loop down the cutting tool and and so this edge here that was the cutting edge as the tool moves sideways through the material and so that would be the edge if i go back to my screen share That edge would be this cutting edge that we see right here that moves through the workpiece material. So that's material removal by large chip formation. Um, are there more manufacturing processes? Water jet. I don't know if that is too specific. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the question is, are there more manufacturing processes? Yes. Yes. The answer, of course, is yes. How many? A lot. A lot. Probably thousands, maybe millions. So there's a lot of manufacturing processes. We only talked about a couple of them. In this class, we're going to focus on material removal by large chip formation. We're going to focus on milling and turning. And um, the real reason for that, well, there's a couple reasons. One reason is we normally do this class live in the lab and all that stuff. And, and we have access to a lot of milling and turning equipment. So it's something that we can easily use as an example. So that, that's one reason that we use milling and turning as our examples in this class. Does anybody else know another reason we might use them? And I may have talked about this last week. So yeah, they integrate with CAM software. Mostly we're using the CAM software because we're talking about um, milling and turning. Anyone wanna, so safety, yeah, the CNC machines that we're using have safety interlocks. They're especially safe when we're using the machine tool emulators because it's real, well, I suppose your computer could fall over on you and you could get hurt. But it's really hard to stick your finger inside the rotating equipment when it's just an emulator. Um, so it's not it's not safety. We uh, we we focus on material removal by large chip formation. We focus on this milling and turning, really, because it's still probably the most impactful. It's still the most impactful um, manufacturing processes in the world. So if you think about it, too many links built into my uh, presentation here. All right, so if you think about all of the stuff that you buy, all of the stuff that you interact with on a daily basis, I, I don't think you can find anything that's more than three steps removed from a machine that cut metal. So, and I, and I say this, so did anybody eat a piece of fruit today? Yeah. Yeah. 
all right, ate a piece of fruit today. So you interacted with that piece of fruit. How did it get to you? Uh, from the grocery store. From the grocery store, okay. How did it get to the grocery store? Probably on some kind of truck or mailing. Probably on some kind of a truck, right? So one, the cabinet that it was sitting on in the grocery store couldn't have been made without machines that cut metal. The truck that transported it to the grocery store could not have been made without machines that cut metal. In, in fact, the tractor they used when they harvested whatever it was, if it was an apple, the tractors that they used when they went on the field, they all require these machines that cut metal. So even though we're very excited about 3D printing and additive manufacturing, and, it, and that is changing the way we do things around the world, these milling and turning operations are still probably the most prolific manufacturing processes in the world today. And so that, that's why that's why we focus a lot on this. So um, again, in turning, the workpiece rotates, the cutting tool moves through the turning workpiece. In milling, the tool rotates and the rotating tool moves through the, the workpiece. So, and, and we watched a couple of videos of this. By now in class, if we were on campus, everybody would have been in the lab once and you would have all gotten a chance to interact with the CNC uh, with the CNC milling machine by now. And, um, and we would have, but, but you've seen the videos. So what controls how those machines work? Or, uh, or as, as, as manufacturing engineers, if we're deciding we're gonna be the manufacturing engineers, what controls how, or what are, what are the things that we get to choose? So if, if we want to run our manufacturing company to make stuff people want, and we've got processes Professor, that we're applying to, yep. I can't see what you're writing on the whiteboard. Yeah, I'm going to switch over. Okay. Did I switch over? I think I did. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So we got manufacturing is making stuff people want. We use processes to make the stuff people want. How do we control the processes? With our CAM software. All right. So we can use CAM software. And, and the purpose of CAM software really is, the, the purpose of CAM software really is to take the idea of what's gonna solve the, the customer's problem. So to take the art or the idea and um, the designer, when, when they do this, they take their idea and they usually make some drawings, they make some sketches, things, right? Things like that, right? So they create art. And the art describes the part that they want to make. And what we use the CAM software for is to understand the art, so the solid models or the drawings and things like that. And when we're using that to create tool paths. So that we can understand how the tool is going to move through the workpiece material to make the thing that we wanted. So, so we use CAM software. So if we if we focus on milling and turning, let's just let's just for a second let's talk about turning. So when we do a turning operation, we've got a workpiece here. So what a turning operation does in, in the lathe is it makes, so if we get an outside diameter turning, so O, B, turn. 
So outside diode turning, we've got our, our cutting tool here. It's like the video we watched, the, the, the workpiece is rotating this direction. As it rotates around this direction, the tool is feeding in this direction. And, and a chip forms right here on the top edge of the part. And we can change from the initial diameter to the final diameter by this amount here times two. So this is called the depth of cut. And, and so the designer, the person who's created the art, they've told us what the final diameter needs to be. They've told us what diameter we need to make this round part. And in order to get that, we have to rotate the workpiece with some speed. Rotate the workpiece with some speed, and we need to move the tool through the workpiece with some feed. Now, I, I talked about haikus last week, right? And I said engineering's math, mm -hmm. just a bunch of word problems, cancel the units, right? And, and so let's, let's think about the word problem here for our engineering, for our OD turning. So if we want to get a specific diameter and we have a specific diameter, what do we need to choose? Or what can we choose? We need to choose an appropriate depth of cut. So we need to have an appropriate depth of cut. And so that depth of cut will determine the initial and the final diameter. Now, what else is going to impact our ability to do this? I got a I got another video. I'm gonna have to search for it for just a second, so. Okay. What's gonna What's gonna affect our ability to do this? How precise our depth we've got. How precise our machinery. Is. How precise our machinery is. How precise our machine is. Okay. So uh, if our machine is not very precise, we may or may not get the final uh, diameter that we were looking for. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What what else will impact our ability to make this part? The material that the base is out of. So the material the, the stock material. will definitely impact our, our ability to make this part and how we make this part. Anything else? Cutting tool? The, the cutting tool itself will impact that. And so it's the tool material and shape. Now, why do you think the, the tool material impacts this? Relative properties between the, the, the stock material and the tool material might impact how fast you can cut or if you can cut without deformation. Yeah, so I, I guarantee there will be deformation no matter what happens. So whenever you push on something with something else, both of the things bend. Now, would you believe that if the workpiece material is harder than the tool material, my daughter's baking a cake or bread or something. I don't know what she's making, but uh, my home office is the kitchen. Um, would you believe that if the workpiece material is harder than the tool material, then the tool will get smaller faster than the workpiece gets smaller? I believe that. Yeah, intuitively we believe that. In fact, I've seen it in uh, in practice 
Um, we, we have a, a, a small manufacturing company that we run. And one of the things we do is we manufacture, we, we machine very hard materials. Sometimes you're using a material that's not as hard as the material that you're cutting. It, it, so the tool wears out faster than the workpiece does. So it, it's actually kind of uh, amazing. So I got a quick video clip. Let me share the screen again. And I got to make sure that I share the audio, share the screen. Yeah, I know that. And so let's just, let's just look at this. So this is a, it's a milling operation, but it's the same idea. And so we get the, the milling cutter. It's moving across the, the workpiece. And if you, if you look at the, uh, the spindle load here, that's the percentage of full power that the machine is at at the current moment. And so, so the, what we varied here is the, uh, is the depth of cut between the different operations. So there's the first one. And so you can see and hear now with this second operation that the spindle load went up. When the spindle load went up, you can hear the difference from the cutting speed. And then here, the spindle load went up again just a little bit. Let me back that up just a hair. So you can't really see in this spindle load meter here, but straight up and down in the spindle load, that's 100%. Where the red starts there, that's 150%. So the yellow region between 100 and 150%. And, and so, and then up here at the end is 180%. And so that's the percentage of the expected full power at that RPM. And so like um, if, there's a lot of different motors and, and engines and things like that. They have a different power output depending on how fast they're spinning. And so, and this was spinning at 6,000 RPM. So at 6,000 RPM, this particular cutting operation was operating at about 150% of the recommended power that it takes. And so what we did here is we changed the depth of cut. And, um, and so by adding more depth of cut, the power required to make the cut goes up. And so, so there's a chance that the final diameter that we want is impossible in the machine that we have. Well, what should we do if that happens? Make multiple runs. So if, if our depth of cut exceeds what the power of our machine it has available, we can make multiple cutting passes. All right, so um, did anybody notice that when we were doing the video with that, that real heavy cut at the end, what, what changed about the sound? The, 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 the noise went like a higher pitch. So the, uh, the amplitude of the sound went up, right? It got louder. Mm -hmm. But I also think the frequency came down. And the frequency came down because that spindle was actually slowing down. It was no longer spinning at the, uh, at the program speed. So we were overloading the, the spindle motor at that point as after we got past 100% or 150%. Now, why isn't it that at, the, at that top end, at that 180%, why don't they call that 100%? marketing. They want to be able to say in the marketing brochure that the machine tool can run at 150% of rated power all day long. So they, Wait, uh, so, so it's all why, marketing. Why did they pick that number then instead of like something larger? Oh, uh, they actually did tests with the motors. And so if, uh, and so on the, on the meter there, they had 100% was straight up. Then they had 150 and 180 over here. And if you're running in this range and the, and the, the needle is going up and coming down and going up and coming down and going up and coming down, 
the the motor has a chance to cool down when it, when it's slowing down. Um, and the real the real risk here is if you stay in this the the range that was red in the graph for too long, the the motor's going to overheat. And so you can get into that range if it's momentary. If uh, if it's intermittent, you can run in the yellow range. And um, it's uh, it's just about the the more you run closer to the top end, the faster the motor's going to fail. And so if you if you budgeted for that and you're intending to replace the motors, you can run at a higher power output more continuously. And it, it, then, then it really depends on your process and your profitability and the cost. Um, I, I know people that run machine tools and um, the environment and the process that they're running will destroy the Z axis servo motor. So the motor that, that makes it, the spindle go up and down um, just because of the process that they're doing, and they budget to change the z-axis every six months, and it's just part of their process. Every six months, they tear down the machine and replace that z-axis, and it was cheaper than buying a uh, more expensive machine that could do that without everything. So these, so we get to choose the depth of cut, right? We get to choose the depth of cut. We actually get to choose the feed rate. The that's the the speed that the tool is moving laterally through the workpiece material, and we get to choose the speed of rotation. And uh, in, in, in large chip formation, so in milling and turning, these are the most critical of these process variables. So the process variable is anything that we get to choose. So we also get to choose what time of day that we're going to make the part. We get to choose the temperature. Well, we may or may not get to choose the temperature in the room when we're making the part, right? If we have good air conditioning, we choose the temperature of the room. We get to choose the operator who runs the machine when they're making the part. We get to choose who that is. We get to choose the color of clothing that the operator wears, these are all process variables. These are things that could impact the, uh, the outcome. In CNC milling and CNC turning, the primary process variables that we care about, the ones that have the most impact on the finished part, are feed, speed, and depth of cut. Now, the feed rate I told you is the speed at which the tool moves through the workpiece. The units for this is length over distance. So, so inches per, sorry, length over distance, same thing, length over time. So inches per minute, millimeters per minute, um, or length over revolutions. So that is how far does it travel for one rotation of the workpiece or length per tooth. And, or length per tooth, length per flute. So that's how far does the tool move sideways, especially in that milling operation, how far does the tool move sideways for each cutting edge on the, the tool? So, so length per revolution is related to length per tooth by the number of teeth. All right, so that's the feed. The speed, what do we, what do we normally have for, for units for speed for rotation? Revolutions per minute. Revolutions per minute, right, RPM. And, and this is our normal intuitive unit for, for rotating things. And we will use RPM, rev per minute. But what's actually more important to us is the speed that the cutting tool edge, remember we had this, we had our workpiece. The workpiece is moving that direction. This is the tool. The tool's moving that direction relative to the workpiece. 
is the chip. So the chip is sliding off. What's really important to us is the relative motion between the tool and the workpiece. How is that related to RPM? Cutting diameter, the diameter of the cutting edge? Yeah, yeah. So it's, you've got to factor in the diameter of rotation, right? And so it's it's the pi times the diameter, right? Is that times RPM? I don't remember. Cancel the units. So so pi times diameter. The units there are length and revolutions per minute. I want to end up with length over time. So if I say rev per minute, divided by, what's the length per rev? Does the revolutions go away? No, I need to multiply. Length per rev. So I could memorize the equations. What's the value in memorizing equations? And we've got, we've got two minutes over now, so we're gonna hurry up and finish. What's the value in memorizing equations? You save a minute of Googling. You save a moment of Googling, right. What's the problem with memorizing equations? You can you memorize it wrong. On understanding. What if you make a mistake, right? Oh. And, and so, so these, with these fundamental things, I think it's important for the engineer to understand that the equation exists and then be able to derive the equation quickly. The ones that you use over and over and over again, you will memorize. And the, uh, the ones that you hardly ever need to use, then why clog your brain with that information? We're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be done for now. There is an assignment up for the discussion forum. <clears throat> I wanna make sure everybody understands what that assignment is. And so I'll just quickly share the screen again, share. Um, yeah, okay. And so in the discussion posts for process variables, if we go to the discussion forum. Um, where did it go? In discussions, manufacturing process, processes and process variables. So read the post in this thread. Then create a post that names a manufacturing process and the primary process variables that control it. Do not name a process that was previously listed. If you go first, you can pick anything and you can pick the easy ones. If you go last, you're going to have to think of something nobody else already said. So there is some value in going first. On the other hand, if you go last, you get to be really creative. But we, uh, we discussed at the beginning of class that there are thousands of different manufacturing processes. And so I want you to look at the process. Don't just name the process, but I want you to think about what are the most important process variables that you could think of that control that process. You don't have to know the answers. I want you to think critically about it though. Um, so that's, uh, that's there. Home. See what else we got to do. There's the uh, do the lab stuff. You, if you haven't already had lab, you'll get there uh, later today. Uh, we're going to do the first two chapters and getting started with CAM for free. And I want you to go to WPI CNC. I want you to do the basic manual operations in the um, the basic manual operations. That is not the first exercise listed. You can do the exercises before that. I don't care if you do those exercises. Uh, I just want you to do this one. And um, let's see what else we got that's graded. Uh, there'll be a survey that you need to do on Friday. 
There'll be a quiz that you need to finish on Sunday. That quiz will include questions from lecture and questions from lab. So there is no graded lab assignment this week. If you go to the labs, um, we should have licenses for a spree for everybody by the end of the day today. As we get those, we'll send them out to you. Um, they emailed me this morning and apologized for being late getting them to us. Uh, but we should thank them anyway because they're getting them to us at all. So um, if you haven't already had lab, you'll talk about that in lab. Um, I will see you guys on Thursday at this time. We're going to finish up discussion of process variables, and then we're going to talk about the process of going from art to part. So the process of taking the designer's concept and making it a prototype part, we're going to focus on doing that with CNC machining because that's what the class focuses on. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, feel free to reach out to the discussion forum or by email, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you. Professor. Yeah. Will, will you be posting your slides to Canvas? The slides are posted now. If you awesome. go to that Thank uh, you. week one schedule, there's a link that says slides. Um, and uh, the Zoom thing is a link to the live Zoom meeting. Uh, once I have the recording for this live Zoom meeting, I will link that also right on the same place. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay. Do we not have class Zoom on Wednesdays? We're not gonna do the Zoom on Wednesdays unless we decide we need to. So okay. far, I don't I, think we need to. Okay, thank you. All right.